Welcome everyone. Please uh, feel free to go ahead and get some food and then come uh, bring your food up here. Uh, the food will be available as we, um, as we hear from our speakers uh, this afternoon. My name is Bill Cavanaugh. I'm the director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology. We are one of the sponsors of this event. Uh, and I want to give thanks to the other sponsors of the event. We, this has been a cooperative effort. Uh, a, a team of many people has been working on this for the better part of a year. And I want to thank the people from Fairtrade Chicago, especially uh, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Uh, hey, go, Catherine. Mission and Ministry uh, from DePaul, especially Scott. Scott Kelly, um, Environmental Studies, uh, Christy Klimas, um, the Net Impact at DePaul, the DePaul Fair Trade, the United Students Against Sweatshops, uh, and forgive me if I um, left anybody out, but it's been a, a cooperative effort. This is part of um, our center's uh, series on the Corporal Works of Mercy, this, that we've been doing this year. The Corporal Works of Mercy are a traditional series of uh, uh, Catholic um, uh, devotions about uh, helping out our fellow human beings. It comes from the verses in the New Testament where Jesus says, whenever you give food to the hungry and clothe the naked and visit the prisoners, you do that to me. And so it's a kind of sign that uh, there's divinity, there's sacredness in in the poor, that when you see the poor, you see God. And this was part of the spirit of St. Vincent de Paul uh, as well, seeing the sacredness in the poor and the oppressed. He was the chaplain to galley slaves and actually helped ransom the galley slaves. So I think St. Vincent will be right here with us tonight, uh, shining a spotlight on those who need uh, liberation from oppression today. And that's part of what the mission of the Vincentian mission of DePaul is all about, uh, to use our education to promote uh, social justice around the world. So tonight we'll have a panel of three uh, really superstars in the world of um, uh, fair trade fashion. And I will introduce each of the speakers uh, at once and then they will come up, they will each talk for about 15 minutes and then we'll have time for discussion after that, and then our fabulous uh, fair trade fashion show uh, immediately following about 7.30. So I'm delighted um, to have uh, Nasreen Sheik, first of all, our first speaker uh, tonight. She has been described as a fiery 20-something, and 20-something uh, because she doesn't know her exact age. She's a native of southern Nepal in a village where girls' births are not um, officially recorded. And so um, she talks about how the, the message to societies, rural girls especially, is that they don't matter. And she was by age 9 or 10 working 15 hours a day in a Nepali sweatshop, um, but eventually found, and she's going to tell more of that story, but eventually found her way out of that world and has decided to dedicate her life to helping people escape uh, that world. And so she has founded a cooperative called Local Women's Handicrafts in Kathmandu, Nepal. And they have uh, trained hundreds of Nepali women, many of whom have escaped from forced and abusive marriages and forced labor. Our second speaker tonight is Donnie Hodge. He's the CEO and president of Alta Gracia, which is a collegiate apparel company based in the Dominican Republic, and it's the only one that provides local workers a way out of poverty. It's the anti-sweatshop, and it's the only apparel factory in the global south that boasts a living wage three times the legal minimum and high health and safety standards, and they, they produce a lot of the collegiate apparel that you can find available in uh, universities across the United States, and this is in large part uh, Donnie's project. He has 40 years of experience at apparel and home textile manufacturing. Uh, the former president and COO of Knight's Apparel 
and um, recently named Leader in Residence at Emory University, a regular guest speaker at college business schools across the country, and one of the leaders in the fair trade movement. And our third speaker is Father Andrew O'Connor. He's a priest of the Archdiocese of New York. He's a native of Chicago. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1996, and he's one of the only priests that gets to hang around with Cameron Diaz because he founded a fashion company called Goods of Conscience that imports uh, cotton from a, a cooperative of indigenous producers in Guatemala and makes it into uh, beautiful clothing in, uh, in his parish uh, in New York. And so he has been uh, featured in Vogue magazine, American Craft magazine, and uh, the Wall Street Journal, I believe, and many other um, uh, uh, venues. Uh, and he's also an artist. He has um, completed several large-scale permanent public sculptures, sculptures in New York City since 2016. So please uh, join me in welcoming our three uh, tremendous uh, guests. I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here today and giving me your precious time and hear my story. I have a deep respect for Chicago Fair Trade for bringing me all the way here, and I have a very really deep respect for DePaul University and Christie. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. I would like to ask a question to all of you. What is fair trade? Is it about eradicating child labor, forced labor, and giving a voice to undocumented workers? Is it about buying and selling fairly? Or is it about transforming the world holistically through the principles of fair trade? When most people think of fair trade, they think of sustainability, safe working condition, and living wage. What is less understood are the values at the foundation of these principles. In 1946, the values that established what we know as fair trade, they were compassion, peacemaking, service to others, love, kindness. That is what fair trade is for me. I have seen how fair trade principle can literally restore the human spirit through the sense of dignity, pride, and can you imagine what fair trade could do to 7.3 billion human beings on this planet? My dear friends, I'm going to share with you an open letter addressed to CEOs of Global Textile Corporation written by a child survivor of undocumented sweatshops. To the corporation and CEOs holding the power to initiate change, it is my wish that the words I'm sharing with you today become more than just words. I'm asking you to take an action. This action has the opportunity to ripple out into the world with an exponential effect. This effect will change many matters of the existing global trade system. But I promise you, the reward it will bring to the world will be far more valuable than profit. As a girl born in conservative, male-dominated society, I am allowed to know very little of the world around me. Sadly, being an undocumented, I have become a victim of global consumerism. Today, 40.3 million men, women, and children from every part of the globe are the victim of slavery. 151.6 million children are, at the age of 5 and 17 are child laborers. Over 1 billion people live under $1 a day. 
35% of all births and 65% of all deaths go unrecorded. I was born in a remote village where children birth not recorded, never the, never the death are recorded. If you were to ask me how old I am, I could not tell you honestly. I can guess that I first became child labor between the age of nine or 10. I work for well-known clothing corporation that use loosely regulated foreign manufacturing. In order to keep up with their demands for low cost fast production, these factories have set up illegal sweatshop in the inner cities using undocumented workers. Six of us live, work, slept, ate in 10 by 10 room. We were forced to work seven days a week for 10 to 12 hours a day, getting paid less than $2 a day. My only bed is the large pile of clothes I produce each day. At night, I fall lay on top of these clothes and daydream about where they are going to end up and who are going to wear them. If you are reading this and do not know who made your clothes, maybe you are wearing my clothes right now. There are millions and millions of undocumented men and children suffering at the hands of corporate profits. In the sweatshop, I have seen how chemicals and dyes are discarded into the waterways and drains illegally. We used to have a beautiful rivers running throughout the cities. Today, industrial pollutions are the number one problem in Nepal. Nature has never known suffering like it has today at the hands of irresponsible, unaccountable corporate and manufacturing. I do not blame you for stealing my childhood or polluting this planet. I know that in order to become accountable for one, we must be accountable for all and I forgive you. We must make change in the way we produce and trade goods that ensure the rights of every human being and nature. The principle of fair trade have the potential to heal a mass amount of suffering in the world, while also offering an abundant and thriving system of global trade. I'm asking you to please trade working with loosely regulated foreign, man ma foreign manufacturing for working with disadvantaged producers. Trade environmental pollution for agreements to protect the earth. Trade corporates profit for safe working condition. Trade your forced and child laborers for equal workers' rights for men and women. Trade slave labor wage for living wage. Trade steady businesses ethic for transparent agreement of mutual profit. It is up to us to change the world for all of us. Thank you for listening this message and peace be with you. It took so much courage, sacrifice and magic to bring you this message. The little girl that wrote this letter is the woman standing in front of you. In 2008, just like the, I don't know how many of you are aware of the Turkish factory that one of the owner left town without paying anyone. One of the agent made us six people made us work for almost one month and didn't pay us. And when he ran away, we felt completely destitute and disempowered. What happens in Asia is it's so unregulated. All these foreign manufacturing goes there and they only work with the company, company manager and they don't care about environment, they don't care about humanity, all they care about is profit. And when somebody on top makes the decision, it affects only the poor, people like us. 
me and my cousin brother and six other people. We became street people. We had nothing left. I remember my cousin brother told me I have to go back to the village because he's a man, he can sleep in, in the street and he can do anything. But I need to go back to the village because I was turning around 11 and 12. That is when, you know, like sometime when people tell you like you have to leave now and you see the city and you want to go and see the things. It happened to me. I felt like Kathmandu will be the last time for me. And I should go and should develop what is going around. And then one day I was watching all these students going to the school. And I was just wondering why my life is so different. Why can't I have a book? Why can't I have a uniform? Why can't I have a shoes? I was so scared to go back to the village because I knew if I go back there, my, I will get forced into marriage. And I feel if you, like in every darkness, there is one light and all you need are patience and all you need is like to wait for it. And I did wait. And one day, one morning, I was sitting right next to this school corner and I felt something cold and wet on my hand and I looked down and it was a dog. In my village, dogs are forbidden to touch, so I was so scared by that dog. And behind that man was a, a one man and he told me, like, come here, don't be scared, he's like my son. And when he told me, come here, for the for like until 12 years, nobody have ever told me, come here. And I immediately grabbed his wrist and asked him, Uncle, can you please teach me? And I remember the dog was pulling him and he was said, he said like he will come. And I, the next day he came and for the last 10 years, he had been teaching me. He taught me math, science, spirituality, philosophy, everything that I should know as a human being. This is the only photo I have of my childhood. And I was around 12 years old and my teacher took this photo. I miss my childhood. I wanted to be a just like a children. When I came to America for the first time in 2015, and when I saw a lot of the children going to the park and movie, and that is when I started to tell my friend, oh my God, when I was in this age, and you were like nine or 10, I used to work like 15 hours, and like being in the small factory, and not even have a room, uh, 600 pieces were my bed, and uh, then my friend told me it is called child labor. So until 2015, I did not even know what was child labor. Even though I was going to the school, that much disruption is in Asia. When, when I met my teacher, that is when I had a little education. And I feel like education and quality of education is so necessary for each individual human being. That is a tool towards to actually empower everyone. In Kathmandu, in Nepal, only 0.1% women is in business. I was looking all around the data and I couldn't find, and finally I found a small article. There are 1.6 million child labor right now. In Kathmandu, you, when you go there, you will meet a lot of like street women. And one day, I was going to buy vegetable, and one of the women, she was speaking my village language, which is only spoken by 2,000 people. So when I heard her speaking my village language, I was like, you have to at least speak Nepali to look for, look for help. And this woman, she says like she had been tricked and she's pregnant and she couldn't, she couldn't go back to the village and she looked so pain and so much in suffering. I did not have money to support her, but in that time I had a skill and I was making things on my own. And I, bring, I told her like, well, I cannot help you, but maybe you can come and work with me. Her name was Rita. Rita and me and my cousin brother, we started to make things. And we did everything opposite what we did not have in Shrek shop. Like when I was started to make the craft, 
I started to put all my love, all my care, because I knew the more beautiful I will make, the better the quality will be. So in 2008, I took my first loan, and I opened my first bank account, and I started a fair trade organization in the same city. Local women uh, have like, uh, when we were having a six, seven women, instead of selling to big uh, uh, store, we decided to have our own store. And slowly our life became changed, only because of the education. Because my teacher was like giving me all the resources of education. I remember in my room, I, I didn't go to school. I never seen school until the age of 15. And uh, he would come to my room and he would give me every day two hours of class. And I would put my notebook on my lap and I work at the same time and remember all the homework. And then I feel like, uh, you know, sometimes hardships makes you to like so focused and so like, you know, wanting to change. I, had, I knew that education will be the only thing that will change me. I remember when I was around like 13 and 14 and um, my mathematics was not so good and one of the shopkeeper they bought the goods for me and I didn't know how to make invoices he told me like we gave him uh, more piece and he told us now you give it only five pieces and six pieces and that is when again I learned uh, I told my teacher that I need to learn mathematics I'm going to share with you uh, not only just my story but how local women started and also behind the scenes so you can feel them and you can see the energy behind it. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, um, because I'm so much connected to uh, one of the hardships that I have seen in my villages, is still to date. Uh, uh, I have uh, seen some of my uncle uh, being sent to city in very early age, 
and they have returned back to the village and they have lost their eyesight and some of them lost you know like physical disability and at the age of like 32 they ha I have seen them be dead you know like they died three of my uncle have that story not only that my cousin brother who brought me to the uh, to the city he was only at the age of eight and he worked for the bulb factory so um, there, there's like still today date like there's so many of my uh, um, uncles and uh, my cousins and you know uh, my village uh, children are getting sent to the city and they are like fulfilling the world fast consumerism and uh, what I would like to say that you know like when you don't know what you eat, where it come from, when, when you what you wear, we don't know where it come from and who made it. And uh, you know the way you live, the act, and you, whatever you do in your life, if you are not responsible, it affects people like us. You know. So if you would have asked the questions, and if somebody would have ever asked the questions, who made my clothes? those company would have gone back to the manufacturer and they would have asked who made this product and that company would have gone back to that small sweatshop and have found my nine and 10 year old face. And instead of me being working for 10 or 12 hours, I could have literally gone to this school and I always wanted to be an astronomer. And today I'm fighting for human rights because I feel like this is number one priority. So what world is losing right now is creativity. We are losing beauty. I feel like we all human beings are so special. We all are different. We are so unique. And we don't understand the deeper meaning. Like when we, when we will see like how powerful one human being can be, we will never use them as a like fast. It's such a distraction. I feel like humanity does not need to suffer like this. In Nepal, there is a huge taboo with so many things like girls get forced into marriage by the age of 14 and 16. My own 16 year old sister got forced into marriage when she was only 12. She was arranged. She has four children now. I have not seen her for seven years. She had so many dreams. Her dreams turn into silent. She cannot speak much. In Nepal, when women are menstruating, they are considered very impure. They are not allowed to see sun. They are not allowed to eat fruits. They are not allowed to drink milk. They are not allowed to see any men. And they have to stay away from their own house into a hut. If you do the Google search and just search Joe Party, just last January, one of the 23-year-old girl died because of the snake bite. And all these taboos are why against women. So what local women is doing is so much driven towards social projects. And we are making these reusable sanitary pads, which is antifungal, antibacterial. And we go to the villages and we teach women that it's actually opposite. Impure is actually a pure. When you are menstruating, you are powerful. And when we are giving this information, it's literally reactivating these women life and they are understanding that yes, they have been tricked and it's changing people life. And I know that in these mountain villages, so many people, they're only looking for one single chance, one right education. And I feel like we can bring to them. In Kathmandu, People are unknowingly inhaling 20 cigarettes a day and uh, we, make, um, we make reusable bags and we give to the people so they cannot use plastics. 20% of the students don't even have a backpacks and notebooks and pens so we give them a creative backpack so they can go to the school. This is our shop, Local Web Sandy Craft, which I opened in 2011. All the time I say like when you do things from your heart, from your from your soul, not just from the mind. I feel like right now our world is so driven with mind. 
We don't use our heart. We don't use our intuition. We don't use the power of being a human. And when you don't do that, you lose the, your own experience. You know, you lose your own magnetic power that you have as a human being. When in 2011, when I was doing all these things, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just doing out of my compassion and peace and love. People from all around the world started to visit. Journalist, activist, writer, and for me it was all normal. In 2011, one of the women from Canada, she came. She turned out to be a Miss Canada third runner. She wrote my article in Forbes magazine. And until 2013, I had no idea what Forbes magazine was. So when you do things, people will find you. Right people will find you. All you have to do is remember your own memory that you have in your own body. And I feel like when you get to learn how to overcome with your fear, and once you will learn it, you will see so much magic, so much power, that we can all, as a human being, can have a better experience than right now. I feel like right now we're trying to control and, you know, like, make things, like, you know, under control. We don't need to do that. We all are free soul. We're born here to actually, we can create a beautiful planet. Cosmopolitan, I had no idea what was Cosmopolitan again. And they came and they covered our story about forced marriage and they, uh, they followed us. They also talk about uh, the training programs you guys can look at later on. Uh, Huffington Post came and they wrote about our like escaping uh, child marriage and then also um, talking about our training programs and earthquake relief. International amnesty, when they sent people from Germany and Switzerland, or like a writer and a photographer, again, for me, these things were so normal. Like now when I look back, you know, sometimes when you try to do business, you feel like you need to go to the, uh, like, you know, very expensive college and you need to create a, like, a thousand year old, like so many, like thousand dollars you need. You need to have a big plan. You need to know future. I feel like drop those Please, don't believe in moment. And if you do what is important right now, that will bring so much power in you and in your vision. Uh, just recently we had a flood in, in Nepal and we were able to do a lot of flood relief work. And today I'm going to share with you a small videos that is, uh, that is going to show to you a little bit of information how these villages look like and these are the places that we are going to set up our learning center where we take disadvantaged women and we train them with their skills and once they are trained they have two options they can either teach other women how to become uh, skilled and the next one will be how they can become entrepreneur so here's the next video mm -hmm. and so much sadness thing so many people is dead and at this time 2017 we build again flood in Kanepal and like there were also so many people since dead and then so many houses is destroyed and like the people they have the growing things like rice they grow and everything is just finished so yes we get that these concepts I come from India Nepal border side. I don't know exactly my age. So maybe I am 1920, 21. Exactly, I don't know. When I heard about the flood and I feel like so sad and I'm trying to like how can possible we have to help that people. My sister, and she's giving me education, 
and yeah, and she's teach me like how to make the grass things, like how to make the flower. And I just like maybe three years, four years, I just investing my time to learning, and then after I teach the other boys. And we talk with machine, and we saying like, how can possible? We have to do some things. And we trying to arrange the like money some money and then we are able to make a 70 package and we went to there. She said you want to get the married in 13 and 14 and I feel so scared about the married. So scared. When I was like six, seven years old and like nine, exactly like we didn't know, very small then I left my college. In my college when the woman is born and they thought I have to just get married. They think like some boys is coming and they are going to love me and then after I have to get married and that is only the, my life. And you know these things I told to my parents, don't make my life like that. They told to like you can kill me but you don't kill me like step by step slowly slowly and I feel like if we want to change some things, we have to do a lot of process. So of course we are trying to change. Of course I get so much struggle also in my life. When I was small, I didn't see the school, but. Um, I try to, I love to do study. I get the like learn English, English, yeah. That is my education. That's all. They didn't get any from government helping. They didn't like, no one is coming and no one is helping for them. So they say like we are the first and we went to them and we have uh, We give the, um, our rug and then shawl and we give the beaten grass and then they have the spots like little things so they can mix in the rice and they can eat and we give the water uh, inside the water. Oh yes, they have the like very bad water for him. So bad water and we give the pews so they can put inside the water and they can easily they can drink is not so much I mean, he's not so much changing but something is changed. So now is my dream to make the women like independent and like stop to force marriage. We are able to do all the things and we have to respect to ourselves. So many women they feel oh why we born like a woman and so many parents when they got the girls and they say they feel so sad they say why I give the girls and we try to like stop they should have to feel proud they get the girls. I so now I am involved in social work. I just want to become like a normal people and just how kind possible, how much I can, I can support the local people and go down to the various people who really need it. So I feel like my dream is getting a true. It's for me first time this experience and then I'm thinking like I'm not able to change it so much but I feel so happy. And I'm so feel happy because I'm able to support the women.
mind is not there. So in 2015, when I came to America, and I walked into a department store, that is when I realized where my clothes get sold, and I also saw how people were disconnected from the source of manufacturing. So I feel when I see you, I don't see you just a normal human being. You are the power to change the world because you have electricity, you have internet, you know how to speak English, you have the international language, and you all individual here are a leader to actually save these people because some of the women, they don't even know how to sign their name, how they're going to ask for their value. So they are looking up to us. Thank you. She yeah. does a better job of explaining it than, than I do. I'm not going to use that. I have a presentation I'm not going to use. I'll tell you, I'll spend a few minutes to tell you about uh, my background and why I do what I do. Uh, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm South Carolina. I'm pretty proud of my accent. My wife tries to get me to change it, but uh, I'm not. Uh, I've had a long career in the textile industry. I uh, was the senior VP of uh, West Point Stevens, uh, did help Ralph Lauren and Martha Stewart help their, build their brands. I was the CEO of Herbert Children's Wear, so if you had, <coughs> had babies and you had one season other product from Gerber, I, that was me. And in 2008, I was recruited to be president of Knights Apparel. <coughs> Knights Apparel is the largest provider of collegiate apparel in the United States. And so when I went there the, as president and COO, after I'd been there about two years, uh, a year, I guess, I started hearing this thing called a living wage. And the WRC had done a lot of studies about what a family for needs to meet all their basic needs, and that's uh, food, shelter, health care. Uh, <clears throat> you know, there's been a big race to the bottom in apparel. 50 years ago, 97% of all the apparel consumed in the United States was made here. Today, it's less than 3%. So if you're an economics person out there, a major, think about the laws of supply and demand. So there is no equilibrium that's possible with the demand as the U.S. market primarily and the supply as the world. And so what's happened is apparel companies have chased uh, the low wages and working conditions. So, for example, I'm, I've been around the world many, 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 many times. And there's, you know, I've been in Bangladesh and Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and India, and Cambodia, and all. So, I've been there in factories. And, uh, you know, a lot of companies treat workers like Nazarene was talking about because they can. When I heard about this living wage, I decided to do exactly opposite and treat workers with respect because I could. And I, you know, I'll tell you a couple of little things about me. When I was <clears throat> about 10 years old, uh, warm summer night, loud noise out from our house, and when I went out, there's a car that went off the road and had an accident. There were four drunk guys in it. Policeman came, flashlight, and asked each one of them, were you driving, were you driving? They all four said no. And he said, well, it's no doubt wonder the car went in the ditch and nobody was driving. <laughs> so I've always thought about that because who is responsible for making a change? Who, who, exactly who? What does someone who wants to make a change look like? What do they talk like? Are they tall? Are they short? Are they fat? Are they skinny? Are they uh, dark skinned or light skinned? I don't know what it is. I think it's a person who wants to make a difference and a person who's not encumbered by not being able to do everything, they make a difference in their sphere of influence. Uh, I turned, uh, you, I, I speak to a lot of campuses, I teach classes at Harvard, and Yale, MIT, and Emory, and Georgetown every year. And I normally ask all the people, the students there, to take off their tops. I won't do that here. <laughs> But I do that to say, do you have any idea where the garments that you're wearing were made? Do you have any idea the conditions under which they were made? Do you have any idea how the people who made it were treated? 
And you know, this whole conspicuous consumption that has been driven in the U.S. market, I said to someone the other day, uh, I don't go to Walmart anymore and buy underwear because you can't buy two and you buy 12 pack. I don't even know what you do with 12 pair of underwear. But if your business model is sell it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, then you have two choices. You can take the quality of your product down or you can find lower labor rates. <clears throat> Anybody here know what percent of the total cost the people who make your garment? What percent do you think that is of the cost of the garment? Anybody guess? $20 t-shirt in your bookstore. Okay? How much do you think the people who actually sold that garment, what's the cost of those for those people? Half a percent. Half? Half a percent. Less than half. I say like 10 or 2%. That $20 t-shirt, the people who made it, if they worked for Haynes or Champion or, or Under Armour, they were paid about, it's about 22 cents of labor in that. I pay three and a half times the minimum wage. I pay two and a half times the average of every apparel manufacturer in the world. I pay two and a half times the average. And I do it because I can. I do it because it's the right thing to do I do it because I don't give a damn what anybody else thinks. I've told uh, the CEO of Haynes, <laughs> and I've told Joe Evans, and you can tell him I said this, he should be embarrassed. You know, all the CEOs in the parallel industry should be embarrassed. That this is, this is their solution to how to run their company. I have put, I'm going to tell you this, for bragging, I put over $2 million of my own money into Alta Gracia. Uh, <clears throat> Knights of Peril was bankrupt when I went there. In 2008, 2015, I had turned it around and we sold that business to Haynes. Haynes didn't want Alta Gracia. Anybody want to know why? Had 10,000 workers in the Dominican Republic that they were paying here. I decided to pay my workers this much. They would have said, well, what if everybody wants to get paid that much? So I spun it off, and I am the owner, the CEO, the president, the board. I'm everything well to Russia. I don't have a bank loan or a line of credit because I don't want a banker telling me what to do. I don't have a board because I don't want a board telling me what to do. I want to do what I want to do, and I know that what I'm doing is right. And Mother Teresa said, pray for the poor, and then go feed them. So this idea that everybody just sits on their ass and thinks it's someone else's responsibility, and they have no concern for the, in respect for people. And I don't understand how you can have that lack of respect. If that person making your garment lived across the street from you, how would you treat them? And the fact that they might happen to live around the world somewhere in a country you've never been to, you think it's okay then to treat them that way. So that's not who I am. That's, I've never been that person. I never will be that person. Uh, I started Alta Gracia in 2010. Like I said, I'm the owner, the banker, the board, the chairman. Uh, we're in 650 college bookstores around the country. We have 150 employees in our factory in Villa Alta Gracia. Uh, it's a life-changing difference. I have people there that tell me, this is, these are human beings, these are human beings that tell me I was nothing, nothing before Alta Gracia. These are human beings saying this. I've got a 38-year-old mother, she's got three kids. Uh, she lived in a 10 by 10 shack that had a tin roof on it, no bathroom, no beds. Today she has a cement block house and she rents a little small 10 by 10 part of the house to a guy and asked her how much rent she charges and she told me, she said it's very, very, very low. It's much lower than I could, but I rent it to that person because of what you did for Alta Gracia and me. So, you know, I was in the military for a while and talked about collateral damage. I talked about collateral benefit. I have a child now in medical school of one of those workers and that child has told me that they're going to come back to that community and work in a clinic. In 2015 I got a call from a hospital in Santo Domingo. They said I want to talk to Donnie Hodge. I said this is Donnie. And they said uh, 
we've got something very strange going on. We think there's a scam. So what's the scam? Well, we've got workers from this town called Alta Gracia that come here to our health clinic and they're getting health care and they're paying us. <laughs> and I said, okay. And they said, well, you know, people from that town don't pay. They, they, nobody there has any money. It's 95% unemployment, but they're paying us and we think it's a scam. And I said, well, no, it's because I give all the workers health care, health insurance for themselves and their families. And I pay 100% of that bill. We have three new clinics that are built in Villa Alta Gracia because the workers at Alta Gracia can pay their bills and therefore other people who can get free health care. So, that's who we are. We're Alta Gracia. We don't really care what the rest of the apparel industry is doing. We're going to do the right thing. Uh, I'm a little bit ashamed of the DePaul community. Uh, and don't care what you think either, in case you're wondering. <laughs> How many people go to DePaul? 25,000. How many alumni you got? 150,000. How many parents and students you got? 100,000. So here's a community centered around this university of 300,000 people. How many Alta Gracia t-shirts we sell last year? 4,000. So that means that the other 396,000 don't give a damn. And this is DePaul. Georgetown had been a Follett school for a decade. Follett and Marcia Noble went and made a presentation. Georgetown called me in the meeting and said, Donnie, we're thinking about changing our store to Barnes & Noble. What do you want me to tell Barnes & Noble? I said, you tell them I want 10 racks of product and I want it in the front of the store. They said, Donnie wants 10 racks of product and in the front of the store. Today, if you go into Georgetown Bookstore, you'll find 10 racks of product and at the front of the store. When I thought about starting this, I got in my car and drove to do Jim Wilson. I said, Jim, if I start this factory, will you give me orders? He said, Donnie, I will give you a $250,000 order. And this is one man at one university that decided to make a difference. So, that's who we are. That's who we are going to be as long as I'm associated with it. And we'd appreciate your support. Good evening. My name is uh, Father Andrew O'Connor, and it's, uh, I think we should sort of focus ourselves on what we've already accomplished through the talks that have already been presented um, in regards to the topic of uh, clothing the naked and also the overall idea of fashion, evolution, hope that we would uh, bring conscience to not only the apparel industry but also how we live. So I think. Uh, Ashwin Sheik for her way in which you could really begin to live and appreciate uh, tenderly uh, the lives of the Nambalese, of, uh, of women, uh, and the brutality as ultimately of the, the industry. Uh, but also it's really quite affecting to see the way she shows her beautiful gratitude to you. And it, uh, so, thank you. And also to uh, to Donnie, who is somebody who really knows, is a veteran of the industry, he really knows what's happening with uh, and how difficult the choices are to try to accomplish this change. Um, that he's beginning to show some of these realities of trying to get products into the stores. What I'd like to do here, because I'm not only somebody who produces a line of clothing in New York and deal with another aspect, which is the luxury market, but I'm also a Catholic priest and a pastor. And so I'd like to just very briefly get to you to some of the things that we believe in and why the Catholic heritage is particularly uh, able to speak effectively about uh, this justice. For one is, I'd like to look at a few, two photographs. Let's see if I can. So this is, um, Two paintings from the Rijksmuseum, both are concerned with clothing the naked, clothing the naked, this is from the 15th century. 
And there's, there's a guy over there who's holding the dragon and he's receiving a new coat. And you see the people of, uh, are also helping him. These are the fellow that's giving out the uh, cloak is wearing something pretty luxurious, right? What's he wearing? He's got a, a mink shawl on. And that appears to be his wife next to him. So it shows you, you know, somebody uh, who wants to share his goods with the poor. Behind him, though, is something interesting, is that in this painting, you're aware of the city that he lives in. Open windows. What's strange about those open windows? They're blank, right? You just see black in there. This painting, the Dutch painting, is trying to say the civic benefit of clothing the poor. It does the whole city good to empty itself out, and we have a Christian value, although you don't see a cross there except perhaps at the top of the, um, the little uh, portal with the sign of the Trinity there. So, but compare it then with this next painting. Here's something that probably comes out of the tradition that gave us St. Vincent Paul. Uh, this, might, this is a French painting, but it might be something that refers to Francis de Sales in Geneva. Uh, it could be also something in Rome. In this painting, you don't really see much of the city, do you? You see the beginning of a modern problem, of people leaving where they live and entering into the city and entering into what creates modern poverty, anonymous poverty. You also see uh, someone who is given to the poor who is himself um, not well dressed, but is religious. Something else. What do you notice about the poor man, the man that's receiving the clothing? He looks actually pretty healthy. There's a bit of light gracing him. And you see the church in the background. It says that when we give to the poor, we begin to enter into something which is invisible but truly glorious. We're a part of some wonderful uh, work that we should, instead of being afraid of, should embrace. Also, the motivations behind these uh, paintings deal with something that was natural in years before and becomes not natural now. So I'd like to just say why. Here is a quotation from King Lear. King Lear is, was a king who didn't want to be king anymore. He had three daughters and he said, do you love me? And two of the daughters said, we love you more than anything, even more than her. I love you even more, right? So they overdid it. The third daughter used real reason and also understood her, her, her office. She said, there was the daughter that really loved. The father was the youngest one, Cordelia, who simply said, I love you no more, no less than a daughter should a father. So he banished her, get out of here. And he was exchanging his kingly role for adulation. The beginning of, if you will, modern luxury. And here, this is an admiral's uh, cloak uh, from the Anglo-Dutch Wars, and there's those lions. This lion of king refused to defend the helpless daughter. He has to relearn what it means to be king. Reason not the need is what he says when, after he's given over his power, he wants the luxury of men around him uh, uh, to boast his ego and his daughter says, you can't have them. Well, why not? There's no reason to have them. He says, reason, not the need. He needs to integrate the king and what he was meant to be. This also is probably one of the earliest gunshot wounds through a head. Um, also
also in the Rex Museum. And it's something about the problem that we have to deal with with sustainability. When we talk about what we need to do, we need to be told to us. We need to be educated on how to do it. That's a problem is that it's so intellectual, the reason is somehow separated from who we are, uh, that we need to be uh, reminded so specifically about it. I developed a fabric called social fabric, and it alludes to uh, the problem and the solution of what we live in, that we, instead of living in a, in a world in which we do mutually agree uh, for higher reasons to love and aid each other, that we've lost, if you will, the social fabric. We live uh, in ways in which, not necessarily that we're supposed to be condemned for it, but we live for by individualism, that our own reason is going to deify me. I make the decision about what I want to do, and it isn't ref in reference to others. So that's really our condition that ordinary people live in. This is where, supposedly, it came about. This is Marie Antoinette, the big villainess of the aristocracy. Let them eat cake when the people were starving. She actually never said this, and it was part of the propaganda after the revolution. But nevertheless, it does show the way in which the aristocracy, the people who are privileged, or live so distantly from those that are in need. They don't know how to attend what their actual needs are. After the revolution, this was um, Marie Antoinette uh, 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 was executed in 1793 with Louis XIII, the king. And then the reign of terror happened that in order to overthrow the great aristocracy and solve the problem of the rich, uh, it only created a new elite, people that were even more bloodthirsty and terrible. And so once Robespierre was finally himself the one who had sent so many to be guillotined, there was a first fashion revolution. I thought this would be interesting because we're going to have a fashion parade and see what it means. This was the first fashion revolution, if you will. And that is uh, 1794 in July 21st when Robespierre uh, was executed, and these creatures came out on the streets of Paris. They called themselves les incroyables et les merveilleuses. They dressed up like aristocracy with gorgeous clothes. They began to be, um, they also wore unusual hair uh, styles à la victime, as if they were going to be sent off to be guillotined. Their heads were going to be cut off. They, they refused, they suppressed the letter R when they surprised it. And you can see that they're wearing clothing that says that was fighting against the, uh, the Jacobin and the Sunk Code. Back to Marie Internet is that, like in, uh, in Versailles, she began, she was. Um, to try to understand what it was like to live like the poor. It began to be something that was held against her and most people, but nevertheless she really did valiantly, as a queen, really try to emulate the poor. So she created this Amour de la Reine, and it's in Versailles today, so where she tried to, uh, she didn't actually milk cows, but she dressed up like somebody that would. So, how about our attempts to try to um, uh, to engage in the poor means also that we can be a little bit too rationalist, rational about it, have too many statistics. This is Edmund Burke uh, gave a speech about uh, Marie Antoinette, and uh, who he knew her personally. He was an Irishman, and so for the Irish, Marie Antoinette is almost is like the Virgin Mary. Uh, it used to be that Irish, to even graduate from school, would have to memorize this speech of Edinburgh. 
Um, it's been 16 or 17 years since I last saw the Queen of France. It's what it began with sin, delivered in 18, 1793, but it led to Catholic emancipation and had direct consequences here in the United States for bringing Catholics here. Another aspect of our, uh, our work of, uh, with garments or anything in the arts uh, is that we need to see that um, the beauty of what happens when children think that they can do things. There are artists that are only different by degree rather than kind. For many of us attempting to make things, we're too embarrassed. Or take, for instance, trying to get somebody to sing in church. Oh, I can't sing. Uh, try to do other little things that you say, well, you've got to try. Something of that person who can do and express himself is in you that must come out. Um, I go into, uh, I think that the way in which we can solve some of the differences is through craft and through a, an embrace of things that are not perfect and that are then quite perfect. Um, in the garment that I make, that I'm wearing, the, the social fabric, you combine things that are not made, that are high technology. I have a high tech reflective fiber in the, in the cloth and it uh, reflects light. It's not made with human hands. It's combined with things that are made with human hands. So thinking about how it is that we act as consumers is really quite critical. What do, how do we feel about things that are valued, that are not made by human hands, that as soon as we buy them, like an iPhone, they're immediately devalued. How things that we do not value before we buy them grow in value. I wanted to, I made a little lecture today about uh, the shoes of Dorothy. You have Oz Park nearby. Yeah. And this is uh, part of an extension of the American relationship with um, handmade things. I noticed that in the book that Frank Baum wrote, the slippers of Dorothy are made of silver. And so I wanted to talk about silver, an allusion to the Wizard of Oz, that tells us a story about how good and beneficial it was when we lived in homes where we made things. Um, I mentioned this morning that most brides had to have a dowry, in the, even in the United States, and it would generally be something that would be made of silver, like a tea set, that we showed hospitality. And it was also something in the bank account that could be converted into something that would save a family in dire necessity. Um, I also would compare in this particular silver, this is a silversmith that I work with in England, he did this, and the uh, silver bowl is all made by hand, but it's made to be so immaculate that it appears to be by a machine. This one is silver that is made to be dirty so that it looks like clay, and so the, um, the two worlds of the dynamism of how we make things and put them together really are, are a blend of those two things. So our spiritual work is very exciting when we put that together. This is my own chalice. Uh, that is a chalice that doesn't stand up uh, except by the hand. And also is to indicate something of our responsibility uh, that we're the ones that make um, the, the message, the sacrifice of Christ stable and realize those are 12 star points. Um, this uh, weaving, although it takes place in Guatemala, I went back to Guatemala to do uh, the project in which cotton originates there. Uh, you might see some of the same looms in the streams, would say, in, in, the, uh, in Nepal or wherever. These are the ways in which the world still works in the home, and uh, that's part of the problem of how do you benefit this uh, salvific homework, if you will, uh, without making a culture a piece of uh, something from National Geographic. Um, 
these are the four, three of the, actually I've got uh, three written there, right? No. There's four principles to Catholic social teaching. This is sort of the end of the talk, and I'll show you some pictures. But one is that somehow we were able to see in the garments that we buy the dignity of the worker. The hand, human hand, is unique, and it remains unique, even though we live in a technological world that says that it's better than human beings. I think we need to revolt against that. Secondly, is the bien commun. You know, the bien commun, also the, the common good, recognizes that we live in a shared community. I think this is really possible with the growth of consciousness about environmental concerns. And um, globalism, as I said before, should also um, open up the horror in our, in our lives that leads to shame, conversion, but also something uh, beautiful is communion with those who are poor is a great lesson that Lear learned. Third thing is really important, is, and it's also one of those difficult Catholic terms. Principle of subsidiarity is to recognize that when we want to go and help, we are not the gods that go in and do the helping. It has to be a recognition that there are already good people there who are ready to do the good thing. They're equipped, as human societies are, uh, as human families are, with doing the thing. So it means that our reason that leads us to know about what needs to be done needs to be instructed with faith. Uh, faith in God allows us to mediate mistakes that we might make. And finally, of course, there is the uh, uh, helping the poor is glorified. Here's an old St. Patrick's. She, this was a model that was on Project One Runway. And some of my reflective fiber there. Uh, and then these are uh, um, out in uh, Santiago de Atitlan. This is where Father Stan Rother, an Oklahoma priest, was was put, was killed, and is the first American-born martyr back in uh, in 1981. And so there, the model there, he's a priest, and uh, he's wearing one of our garments, and he uh, sort of resembles Stan. Here's uh, just the Lower East Side, high fashion models, and uh, some up close of the type of fabric that we use. This is cotton as it was originally uh, um, discovered by the Europeans after the, uh, uh, the discovery of the Americas. And that's it. Some more stuff that you'll see from. So thank you very much. Well, I want to thank uh, our three speakers. Again, three very different people from very different backgrounds. Uh, doing different things, but in some sense uh, come, coming together in this uh, tremendous sort of global communion uh, that we can feel uh, despite our differences um, uh, when we attend to those in need, um, there's something uh, kind of sacred that happens there. So please join me in thanking our three speakers. been told that our um, fashion show is ready to go. Um, we have a couple of minutes um, for questions. If anybody wants to approach one of the microphones and ask a question of our speakers, um, otherwise we'll, we'll move to the, uh, um, to, the, to the fashion show within maybe five minutes or so. So maybe just a, a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, yes, I thank you for coming. That's beautiful. I took notes and just, I like the question, everybody has the potential to take care of themselves. You know, we're not doing things in the, in the poor neighborhoods here, Park Manor, uh, Inglewood, these are poor neighborhoods, that we're looking at cooperatives to have people do things themselves. Uh, so get, forget Whole Foods and these things, make our own food, do our own clothing, exactly. So we need to do this and take take that. Uh, the gentleman there, uh, the, first of all, did you, did you say the fourth principle?
and my only my question would just be, um, how do we get to uh, this? the sustainability that, that you brought up, uh, Father Cooper. Uh, how do we get the psychology changed that people that we're not the gods? Because I run into this problem, it's not just not just clothing, it's racism. You know, whites come into the black neighborhood and try to save me the gods and save the blacks. So how do we get this in clothing? How do we get this, this change in psychology to help people understand that we're in a, 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 a symbiotic relationship? We all have to care for each other. Briefly, you said the fourth principle is always to remember that there are poor, the poor, and there are people that for no fault of their own have, are victims of great injustice. And so there is um, that's something that we're gravely called to respond to help the poor. Um, your uh, question is very accurate, thank you. Um, yeah, we're not gods, and so the uh, the commonly in the church, St. Augustine says, the credo de intelligas, faith seeking understanding. That's how we do it. It's, it's a part of it's a daily work of uniting through, that's our, our essence of education, is not simply uh, anointing ourselves as God, but also to, but to use the reason we've been given to observe and to let faith instruct it. I feel like um, nobody's poor, and we all are one. And some human, um, when they have like enough resources, they control over and they make the other people poor in resources. But as an individual human being, we all also have potentials. And I feel like if we really want to create each individual powerful, we need to go back to our community and we need to work with each individual and teach them the real quality of education and sustainability and what actually one society can do in a way that we all can sustain and not dependent on other countries or another like, you know, far, uh, we can share our resources, but if we don't need to depend, we don't need to control. We need to give away those control systems, you know, and provide equal and quality education to each individual human being. And that education will lead to all human beings as a unified consciousness. And that unified consciousness, consciousness will lead us to a different experiences than now. We will be much more happier and be in peace. Thank you. I'll answer that question from my perspective. You know, I don't think you do anything. You know, some companies pay the workers nothing so they can't afford anything and then they decide what to give them. It's not the approach I took. My approach was I will pay them a living wage and they do what give them the respect and dignity. They can do what they want to. It's none of my business. If one of my workers wants to go uh, party all weekend and spend their money, that's their right. If another wants to send their children to, it's their money. They earned it. And that's the, that's the reason I like to live in ways. It takes all the bullshit out about what is right and what is wrong and what's the standard. You pay them a living wage and then let them decide on their own. Empower people. If you don't empower them, then anything you do is just temporary. Thanks again for our speakers. Um, are there any more questions? Okay. Um, if there aren't no more questions, then I'll introduce Andrea Dennis from Chicago Fair Trade, and she will uh, be MC for the fashion show. Woo!